uh, Bonner Milltown History Center and Museums uh, roundtable session. Um, before I introduce Kim Brigman, who's going to introduce our speaker, uh, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, one is that the next round table is going to be on the 20th of March. It'll be right here uh, at 2 o'clock. Can you speak up, please? Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and I want to th thank St. Anne's for letting us use the facility here um, and Father Poole. Um, and when I should mention that next, after next week next month's program we're, well the church is going to prepare a pasty dinner homemade pasty dinner um, which benefits the youth of the church uh, so you're all welcome to attend um, and they're wonderful uh, thanks to MCAT for filming and to Joe and Walter for helping with the sound um, and I should tell you remind you that the restrooms are on the other side of that uh, panel there, uh, and that we have coffee and cookies uh, in the back here, and um, now I'm going to turn it over to, oh, uh, if you have cell phones, be good to turn them off, and uh, then I'll turn it over to Kim Brigham, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Miney. Before we got into the main program, I was uh, I, I wanted to do a short, and I emphasize short, reading from a book that may be familiar to you. I need a chair here. It's, it's called Timberjack. It's the, of course, the, the movie that we all watched last year was based on um, the, the book by Dan Cushman who wrote Timber Jack in 1953. Dan Cushman was a prolific writer, a Montana writer um, from Great Falls. And uh, in 1953, his most famous book, uh, what became his most best known book was uh, Stay Away Joe, which was made into a movie itself um, starring Elvis Presley. And it was based uh, over on the Rocky Boy Reservation. The same year, I find this interesting, the same year um, is this 1953 was when the book Timberjack was published. And it's, um, the movie, of course, isn't exactly the same as the book. Um, among the differences, um, the main difference, I think, is um, the book is set in British Columbia, in Canada. And, uh, but it's the same characters as we saw in the movie, etc., including the, the hero of our story was um, Tim Chipman, played by Sterling Hayden in the movie. And so the reading um, that I wanted to do uh, is based, it kind of jumped out at me when I was reading the book. Um, it's based, it's set on when he, uh, Tim Chipman is um, surveying a uh, remote piece of, of woods cool. up in, they call it, he calls it the High Chilkeo. I don't know if that's a real place or not, but um, it becomes the contentious piece of, of woods that uh, Croft Br Bruner and Tim Chipman end up fighting for, and the book ends, unlike the movie, the book ends with a life or death struggle on a log jam that they're getting ready to blow to to move down the river. And uh, you can probably guess who wins the struggle and who ends up kissing Lynn Chilton, or Lynn Chilton, I guess, at the end. But. So it is short, it's only less than a page. <laughs> it snowed during the night, a wet, heavy s snow that sagged their little tent and gave forth a dampness that penetrated everything. Their boots were stiff from dampness and cold, and it was a long job in the gray, cloudy morning to get wood burning and to cook breakfast. They went on. I should explain, in this, in this scene, he's with, uh, he's with uh, young George Holman, 
somebody who's helping them out on this survey, and they're on horseback. They went on. It was wild country here, untouched by the axe. As they traveled, the sun came out, melting the snow except for shaded places high along the ridge. They crossed Granite Knob and doubled back to strike the Chilkeo along its western limits. It was magnificent timber, clean growing with scarcely any underbrush, the huge trunks rising straight as pillars in a Greek temple. The trees rose from brace roots broader than a man's outflung arms, tapering to trunks that grew without a branch to remote heights before their green tops were spread toward the sky. He left young Holman, telling him to stay behind, and walked by himself through the forest. It was very soft underfoot, the accumulation of centuries. The stillness was remarkable. High, high overhead, he could see the sky. The forest had a primeval quality as though it had always existed and always would. It was like being alone in a vast cathedral, and it made him feel lonely and insignificant. It was a disquieting feel, feeling and yet enjoyable. That was why he had left the kid behind. He liked Holman, but he talked too much. Out in the forest, there was seldom any need for a man to say anything. He got to thinking about timbering the tract, destroying the cathedral, he thought with a little smile. He did not like the thought. Then his better judgment told him that the forest was mature there was no further growth in it, and there was no destruction in taking out the great trees that had reached old age and letting the young rise in their places. My printer wasn't working, so I, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Scott Keene. Um, but I couldn't print it out what I, what I had down here, so I, I'm using my iPad. Hope it works the whole way through. Um, Scott and Joan have been neighbors of mine for 25 years or more. Um, their first home was on 7th Street in West Riverside in 1978. And in 1982, they built the, the home that they live in now up on Marshall Grade and raised their family there. Their three children went through Bonner School, and Scott and Joan both served on the Bonner School Board. I never really knew what he did um, or how he, how he was so invested in the history of logging until one day I was channel surfing on TV a few years ago and came across the History Channel and the Modern Marvels show, and there was Scott. He, it was an old time, it was a show about old time logging techniques and he was called the logging tech, if I <laughs> read this right. Um, and then I got to think, well, he must know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, he was a graduate of the UM School of Forestry in 1981. Um, he has been a forester for Champion Timberlands, for Plum Creek tib Timber for nearly 20 years. Um, pro pro procurement forester for Stimson Mill and Bonner, and then for Tricon Timber. He's currently a forester for the Salmon River Wood here in Missoula. Scott chairs the Historical Committee for the Montana Society of American Foresters. That's the committee that built and expanded the forestry interpretive area out there at the uh, Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. Um, this <laughs> April, they'll be hosting their 20th Forestry Days at Forest Port Missoula, and Scott has been the chair of Forestry Days since the beginning. Um, 2001, 2014, he was the Montana Society of America Forester of the Year. Um, he was named in 1997 the Society of American Foresters, Missoula's chapter's outstanding citizen he co-chaired two Forest, forest for Humanity uh, Blitz Builds. Uh, communicator of the Year for the Montana Wood Products, uh, also President's Award and Past President of Montana Wood Products. Uh, educator of the Year for the Montana Farm System. UM Forestry School Distinguished Alumni Award. 
He's taught classes, given demonstrations and presentations to a wide variety of group. Scott owns three patents. Uh, he designed and built the remote controlled slack pulling carriage for line machines. And he developed the patented and pla patented the flamethrower for slash burning, AKA Mr. Zippo, he said. <laughs> That was in 1995. Um, he has, uh, I think he has the record for the pumpkin chunkin. 30, 38, 3,800 feet. And uh, he's a world champion. Uh, he won two world championships when competing in the professional logger sports. Uh, held the hot saw world record for 20 years. 5.2 seconds, 5.72 seconds through a 30 inch Doug fir. Scott also co-founded and continues to coach the UM Woodman team. And I could take all the, the whole hour to go on. <laughs> so Scott Keen, a honor. Should be? Is that better? Okay. You're on in the bathroom. <laughs> well, thank you. I had it on mute on my part, but yeah. You know. Well, that's a good way to start off the program. So. Thank you for coming on a beautiful sunny day. You start thinking about the garden uh, when it gets this warm. But um, got about 150 years worth of logging history. So let's get going. So. Broke it down into different parts. First one, felling the trees. So one of the other things we do, um, team up with some of the guys that uh, I competed with, and we go out and uh, uh, cut down and keep the old springboard art alive. So first part of felling the tree is they would make the undercut, uh, that part with the, ch with the cross cut, and then they'd ax in, uh, chop in, that part of the undercut. They come around the back side and with the, with the saw. But around western Montana, you pretty much have to have springboards on these larch. The larch are notorious for having pitches and resins uh, and uh, ring shake in the butt. Plus, your cross cuts get all gummed up. So what they did is they came in with the springboards, got up above that, and that's why you see all those springboards up uh, all by Sealy and such. So, Again, the major things you need for felling, cross cut, springboards, your axe, and your bottle of oil. You had to have your bottle of oil. No. Here's a good example of the springboards. What they did, basically they were no more than a six, eight inch wide board with a little metal tip. Um, cross cut in and then they'd chop out the undercut. <coughs> Here's some of the different uh, teeth configurations on the cross cuts. Um, really the cross cuts have been around for four or five hundred years. Actually they talk about the Romans had saws, but they really didn't get going to the 1800s. And this four peg, what they call four peg and raker, is probably the most common. There's a good example right there. They came in two different styles. They came with a felling and a bucking. The felling basically was two people. You didn't need to do much pushing, um, and two people just pulled, so you didn't have to be as tough as stout. The bucking, the bucking saws were thicker, and because they were designed for one person to be able to pull and push. Um, the teeth on the cross cut, you have four teeth, two pointed one side, two pointed the other side, and all they did was make two slits. So if you took a razor blade and make a slit and another slit, that's all those teeth did. Then the raker came through and just took that and just shoveled it right up. And all those chips ended up in the gullet. There's a good example. One doing one side, one doing the other just making a slit and then the raker coming in and just scooping that up. And then it all uh, curf goes up into the, the gullet. 
Oh. The filer, he was either loved or hated because as you switch from Ponderosa Pine to say Douglas fir hillside, frozen wood to uh, softwood, you had to change your filing uh, pretty much every day. So these saws were filed each night, they'd bring them in, and if he got it wrong, you lived with it all day long. Um, filing is a dying art. They still use cross cuts in the wilderness where you can't use chainsaws. Um, and also we still run them uh, for racing. So, but sort of a misnomer is a good uh, cross cut team will actually out compete, uh, will actually cut faster than a uh, chainsaw. There's a professional double buck, that's Forestry Day. That's a 20 inch larch. Got any idea how fast they went through that? They had a winning time. Three seconds? Yeah, a little more. That was just over seven seconds to do 20 inches. You just see that saw just drop. So if you took, say, even a good 046 still, eh, you guys have done the firewood. Eh, yeah, so, um, yeah. But the trouble is, you do that four or five times, you run out of gas. Still, you know, you throw in a little more petrol. So, but there's a good example. This is the racing saws. See how big the gullets are, but that's the noodles that are coming out. And it is an absolute art to try and get your teeth pointed right and the raker depth so that that just comes out absolutely perfect. But to give an example, Crosscut's been around since 1800s realistically. That four peg raker uh, that we talked about, now we're back to, here's a modified racing saw, four pegs and a raker. Looks a little different, but we're back to that same tile cutting. Here we are a hundred and some years later, our modified racing saws basically duplicate what you know, they were a hundred and some years ago. So, coming around. Oh. The two-man crosscut, so what happens on Monday morning when your partner still hung over and missed the crummy? What he did, that's an inner tube. He'd go over there and tie it to a stump and uh, yeah, that was his partner for the day. So. But, so a lot of times you've been out in the woods where you need to undercut a little bit. You've got a little bit of tension and compression wood. So what they did with a cross cut is they would drive in this undercutter and this is what they look like. You would drive it into the wood. Whoa. You would drive it into the wood, turn your saw upside down so the back fits in one of those grooves. Then you could put pressure on it and undercut, take some of that tension wood off, come around the top. So that was their undercutter. Sometimes they would take their ax, throw the ax in so the handle is parallel with the log, turn it upside down, same, same thing. So. One of the other necessities is the falling axe. Um, this is the traditional style falling axe and it was long handled so that you could actually reach into the center of the log. You would think when you're on springboard you could reach the front, reach the back, but you can't. And so um, these were designed to be long and each guy had one, you took turns, you cut in the undercut, the first cut, and then you had to chop out um, the top cut. And they actually, once you relieve that bottom part, you know, it doesn't take much force. Those chips fall right out. But um, that's the falling axe. The springboard, that was one of the other things they needed. And the springboard is really nothing more than a six, eight inch wide board and had this little metal tip and it was rounded on a curve. And there's the bottom of it. And you can actually, once you get that hole in there, keep one foot on top, put the toe underneath, and you can rock it forward and get the front, then walk it back. And that's why they're curved, so that it can actually pivot. And, uh, but, you know, here I'm 200 and some pounds, and I was on them all day long, so. 
Forestry day, we still use that today. You can see the notch, the little pocket, um, a good springboard cutter can cut that notch in four hits. And then he'll come up, throw the board in, and then once he's up on the second one, um, he starts wailing. So um, there, you know, just that little tip and that board. Um, so come out to Forestry Day, you'll get to see this. So. In the forest itself, how did they determine the, the exact line of drop? They, they had to do that before they did anything yep. else. Yep, yep, and very similar today. The angle of dropping. Oh. Well, I'll repeat the question. How do you aim the tree, basically? Uh, so it doesn't get hung up and it doesn't hit other trees. Very similar to what we do today. You can wedge it a little bit, but the undercut basically determines the direction. And so um, you come in and you would actually, you could take these axes, once you got the undercut, put them in and eyeball them. And as long as you don't cut that hinge wood off, so as you're cutting in the back, you leave about that much hinge wood, and that tree has to follow that undercut. And you can put your hat out there, you can put a stake out there at 80 feet and drive the stake. It's impressive. So um, This was uh, taking that same sport to the next level. They're up three boards high, and you can sort of see they're uh, double bucking a probably a 30-inch log there. But well, anyway, you can see the springboard. That's the notches. Um, but you can take your foot and actually turn that springboard around. So. And a lot of times when you um, had one that was too big, um, you would use this powder wedge. There's a couple of examples in the back. You fill it full of black powder, pound it in, and uh, put a little dynamite fuse on it and run. And uh, that's just that's just about a half a cup, quarter cup of black powder, and uh, just splits these long butts in half. And just black powder. And anytime you're playing with explosives, yeah, you have grins. So, yeah. But they're in the back. They're pretty interesting. They're like a shape charge. That little bit of uh, black powder uh, concentrates that force in one little spot, blows them apart. So. Then we got into the drag saws, the hit and miss. They were mostly used on the landings to feed the boilers. Uh, they were too big, really, to go out into the woods. Um, so they were really designed. They just get in a dry log, um, cut it right there at the boiler, and just feed the boiler all day long. But again, the guys used to have to single buck those into small chunks, split them, and uh, so this thing, they just put the saw up, let it run for 10, 15 minutes, and then they'd have to split it. You know. This was a little hand one we actually have out at the museum. It grabs the log right there, and then it has a little T-stand. That handle is attached to the cross cut. So you just sort of sit there and just do this all day long. So, yep. Uh, then also they had, uh, this was uh, an Appleton. What was unique about the Appleton, still ran on an old hit and miss or a steam engine. This was the saw, went back and forth. But can you see that little drive shaft? That lever, you'd lift up the saw, cut off a block, lift up the saw, and engage that lever. And this was a PTO basically driven. And the log would roll forward a little bit and uh, they'd saw again. So. Starting to get that ingenuity, starting to use machines versus brawn. That's the one we got. Um, she's about halfway rebuilt out there at the museum. So should have it running by 4th of July. So then we started getting in the chainsaws. So Andreas Still, the German, remember that name? Sound familiar? Guess who got this chainsaw named after him? In 1926, he got two patents, and uh, the Germans actually had the chainsaws during the war. Uh, some of our guys stole them and brought them back, and we developed, so we went on our own path. But Andreas still is credited for the modern chainsaw. But they weighed 
you know, 150 pounds, 140 pounds. And uh, we've got a couple of these that are in operation, but uh, it does take two people. And uh, they were designed in the old days, they had a float carburetor, like the old cars with the old floats. Nowadays, they're diaphragmed. You can turn them upside down, left, right. But you had to keep the power head upright. So they were designed to pivot right there. And so if you were doing the felling, unlatch it, turn it, and lock it back in. And you could uh, do horizontal or vertical cuts. But as they, what was that? Oh. But as they developed the chainsaws, they knew how a crosscut worked. So their initial chains were developed after the crosscut. They call them scratcher chains. All they were is the teeth off of the, the uh, crosscut. Um, and for years, that's what they ran. There's a set of them, and they, uh, you can just see the tooth, every other tooth, uh, just like a crosscut. But 1947, Buford Cox was sitting at a wood pile and he was watching a flathead wood borer. If you ever seen those, they have the big mandible jaws and it's just chewing away. And so what he comes up with, he takes that scratcher chain and curls them over so that they chew just like a uh, flathead wood borer. So Buford Cox went on um, to invent the modern day chain which went into Oregon Chain. So if you ever heard of Oregon Chain, it all started with Buford Cox in 47. So, so this one must have been really heavy because it's four man, but, um, but these things were 120, 140 pounds, so they're trying to figure out how to lighten it up. When you talk to a lot of the old guys, and then you do the reading, when they first came out, guys went back to the crosscut, and they go, give me the crosscut, I can do better. So they started making them lighter. So what they did, instead of taking the engine on the saw, they actually put the engine on a cap. This is an air compressor, and that saw over there is actually an air-powered chainsaw. And that's what this would have run. Um, so all your pack, I mean, that thing weighs probably 35, 40 pounds versus 140. So they'd run around with a cat with the air compressor, um, and. Uh, so the guy, you know, didn't have to pack around. How um, much air? What's that? How much air did it take? You know, I put that on the, I put that on the, on the, uh, my, just my shop compressor and runs. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. But also uh, electric. This is a generator, a gen set on the back. Uh, same idea. You just run the cat around and um, uh, lighten up the saw. Um, again, starting to use the noodle. Down south, they used a lot of these Bushmasters, they call them. They're basically just a disc, a disc saw. Um, and, uh, but it was, they were two man saws. Then you started getting in the 60s, um, Home Light, McCulloch's were the, pretty much the saw of choice. Um, and no muffler, well, little bit of a muffler. No vibration dampening. If you ran these all day long, your fingers would be just white. Just, uh, now I can't tell if he's got earplugs, but probably in 65, probably not. No. So, no. I'm a man, I can handle it. Yeah, so. um, but, uh, you know, and this, the evolution, they're starting to get smaller, but uh, they're still trying to maintain the power. Ergonometry for the operator, really didn't come in until the really late 70s and 80s. So, and of course, if you make something, make it go fast, I gotta make it go faster. So that's my small hot saw. So, um, that's the big hot saw. That's not ours, but um, see if this thing will run. Um, nope. No, nope, won't run. Um, anyway, uh, the guys down at Darby made a V6. Um, a V8. Yeah, that's a V8, and uh, but same type of thing, you know. I I got one cylinder. They'll put on eight, and you know, just 
Yeah. But a little bit of trivia I found. The first known sawmill that I can find was actually down at the uh, St. Mary's Mission. Um, Father Ravalli took an old uh, iron wagon wheel, hammered it out, and uh, the mill was water powered. Uh, but 1845, that was the first I could ever find. So, so moving on, the oxen and horses. The oxen, um, a lot of them use the oxen. They weren't nearly as temperamental as the horses. When they were done to the day, uh, you could just feed them some hay. Horses, you had to grain them. Um, and what they did is they made these, uh, they sunk in these crosswise poles and they would make, the, they call these skid roads. And um, so the log would actually roll on top of those. But, you know, here you have, what, an eight pair team and with one teamster. So, um, Oxen were used a lot around this country. So, um, they weren't nearly as stubborn once you got them a good team. Um, still use them. This was uh, just last year over in Indonesia, so they're still using them. So, um, but like on this situation, they would just bring them down to the river, roll them onto the river, and they'd go right back up. You talk to the old guys and you listen to the read the book is once they got into that pattern, they sort of they would follow that pattern. Um, horses were a little different story. Um, you know, they didn't have as much power as the oxen. Still had to use those skid roads with buried logs, but what's that two, four, six, eight, an eight up pair, uh, but that's pulling a pretty good sized log. Um, but at night you'd have to grain them. Um, and uh, so, um, I have a trivia question for you guys. Do you have any idea what those are? Oxen shoes. Oxens are split hooves. Yeah, they actually would uh, uh, shoe the oxens, and they put the little uh, digging wedge on the front, and uh, so. Yeah, if you ever see those, those are oxen wedges or oxen shoes. Yeah. Yeah. The horses, a lot of times, um, would run with these dry shoots. Um, I've seen a lot more of the dry shoots uh, than actually the flumes in Montana. There's actually one up um, just off of Kramer Creek. Uh, the logs are still in place. A lot of times when they were done, they would just put the logs on and bring the, you know, dismantle the, uh, the, the, the chutes, but uh, for some reason they left that one. Oh. Then they're using their noggin again and says, well, we can either drag them or we can pull them on a sled. And they did this up in the swan a lot. And I mean, I think some of these were parade loads. I mean, this would not be a normal load. Um, but a couple horses uh, now could pull a truckload, and uh, but it would mean winter logging, putting them somewhere either right on the train, putting them on the ice on the river, and then floating them down in the spring. Um, that's definitely a parade load. Um, um. Um, they would have the cross. They would have another team over here, and run a chain around that log, and the horses would pull and roll them up. And about every two courses, they chain them down. Um, this is, I don't know how they did that, that's for show, sure. yeah. <laughs> but normally that was just uh, cross-chained um, and they just kept working their way up. You know. um, that's probably a nor more of a normal load. Um, and you know, see there, you've got just a single horse or a mule, um, which is great till you go downhill. They had very little breaks. So, so what they would do is they'd go in um, where the trails were going to be and they would actually roll the snow. And they didn't really have anything to plow it with. So they would just roll it and pack it down so that the horses had uh, some traction and also the runners uh, had some place to, so they wouldn't sink in. But these poor guys, 
um, just as the horses of the teams were coming off, they go down the lake and fill up this water wagon. And that's what this is. This is a pipe that goes all the way through. And they'd keep that a fire lid in there. And again, chop a hole in the ice, lower the barrel, come up. You'd have a cross chain pulling with horses. And they'd fill this thing up and keep that fire going so it wouldn't freeze. And then they'd take it out. And uh, they would say they would only dribble water where the skis went because you didn't want the, where the hooves go uh, icy. So, um, but these guys were doing this in the middle of the night, you know, with lanterns. Yep. Well, this is one that they actually found, the students found up on the Bandy Ranch, up by Ovando, the School of Forestry Ranch. Um, it was in tough shape. So, but with a little research, I actually found the patent for the connecting part. If you look, uh, that little part is that part. So I actually found the in 1902. So then uh, we cut and fit. Dick Clemo helped me cut the timbers, let them cure, and literally it is cut, fit, drill, cut, fit, drill, and um, slowly started coming together. Um, and then that's it. So it was uh, from that pile of wood to that. So, but, um, but some more trivia. The Enabling Act, which is also when Montana became a state, the state or the feds gave the state section 16 and 36. So if you ever look at a map and you see the little blue square in the center of the township in the lower right, the 36, they were given two square miles per, for each 36 square miles, four only for school trust lands. So today, those lands are still known as trust lands, um, and they generate uh, grazing, oil, mineral rights, and timber. All that goes back to general schools. So um, when they became a state, uh, the state, the feds actually granted them 5.1 million acres. So. So then we got to start getting to, okay, if we can sled the logs, how about if we put them on a white, or, you know, basically uh, raise them up. And so um, Silas Overpack is pretty much credited for the, the high wheels. Um, my daughter, Rye, is an extra credit. Um, she was probably eighth grade. Uh, Montana Tech had a um, library of patent books. So we sort of knew an era, and for extra credit, she spent a day with me going through patent. Ron Buttonmeyer made us the hubs, that's the tongue, and um, that's where they are today. Everything red on there is new. So, um, yeah, no, but um, I don't know. That's a video of it. <laughs> Come to Forestry Day, they'll be running. So, no. River drives, of course, out here in Bonner. Um, um, you know, um, they floated a lot of it down the river till they got the rail in. Um, back east, you know, as the lumberjacks, they were in the northeast of Maine. Then they went to the Midwest um, again, using rivers. So they, used, they did the same thing they knew about. Um, you know, there's Bonner, just absolutely plugged. You know. The Wanigans, uh, as they worked their way down, um, slushing out the, um, the dead man behind rocks and sandbars, Wanigan would come down, and that's where they ate and slept. Um, the Bat Toes, they were like a flat bottom boat, um, very little draft, and um, um, the museum over in Coeur d'Alene has one, but what does that remind you of today going down the Missouri? Yeah. Same thing. Flat bottom, low draft. Yeah, they stole the idea. So, but This is over in Marble Creek. Marble Creek is just up from Avery. Um, tremendous amount of logging history, but they had about five splash dams all the way up Marble Creek. 
Um, and uh, these are still in place. Um, and every time uh, the state comes in, I mean, I've pulled, what, 10,000 logs plus? I don't know what they have, but I mean, it's a lot. They keep showing up. Now I'm seeing they're heading up river. They're like salmon. They're going back to their stomping ground, you know. And, <laughs> no. I don't think uh, you'll ever get them, get them out. But it's interesting, when you look at those old pictures, you know, you think about the old days in the big wood. Um, you look at some of those old pictures, they, I mean, it was just medium-sized wood. It wasn't anything huge, and that's what we're sort of seeing. Some of the big ones, of course, floated. The big yellow pine floated, but these small ones did, you know, just sunk. So, the flumes, um, there was some up around Libby I know of, Thompson Falls, um, but you had to have a lot of water. They were a lot of work. You had to be in one spot for a long time. So, the Sanger flume down by Sanger, um, California, was 62 miles long. Um, and a lot of times, instead of trying to float the big logs down, they would pay part, I mean, work their way up uh, where the logging was going, put a little mini sawmill, steam drums, and they would just float the boards down. Instead of trying to do the big logs, they would just float the boards. But yeah, 62 mile long flume, so quite elaborate, you know. So. <clears throat> But then, this is, I think, what we had more around. That what I've seen is what they call the dry shoots. Um, and uh, basically, the horses would drag them down. Uh, they'd grease them on the flats and sand them on the steep spots. Um, but there's actually still some of those up there by uh, Kramer Creek. So, so. Moving by rail. First logging railroad that I can find was built out by Elliston. Uh, 1890, six and a half miles. Um, so, um, wasn't really until um, July of 1881, um, Ephraim Shea really started the whole uh, geared locomotive. So, um, the 1923 number five, a 70 ton geared locomotive was purchased by Anaconda, decommissioned, and uh, 49 is now in Great Falls. In Arizona, yeah, I was going to say, I've looked and I've had, okay, it's in Arizona. It's still alive, though, still around. Okay. Oh. But Ephraim Shea basically started this, the whole geared locomotive, because a traditional locomotive, you get over 3 4%, they were worthless. Geared locomotives basically lock the hubs in like a four wheel drive, they go up to 10 or 12%. So that actually is his, his patent, 1881. Um, pretty simple, boiler, one piston, gear drive. Basically they were just all-wheel drive engines. They revolutionized logging in the woods because they could climb that 10, 12% grade. So, um, the geared, a uh, couple different ones I know that uh, Anaconda had um, besides the Shea. Willamette, Willamette stole Shea's patent later, and that's what we have out in Bonner, um, was the Heisler. The Heisler had the pistons in a V pattern, then went to a gear drive. The Climax had the pistons this way, went to a gearbox, then drove. Anaconda had all four of those models, or the Shea, the Willamette, the Heisler, and the Climax. So, um, just a little bit more trivia, uh, 1900, Western Lumber builds a sawmill, low thrip the mouth of Petty Creek. Uh, 1909, uh, Milwaukee's finished. And it wasn't only nine years later, after the flood, that they moved Western Lumber from uh, low thrip to Milltown. So, but this is probably a pretty traditional, the cats come in, uh, there's the rails. Um, I just noticed him the other day. Just standing there on a shovel. Yep, so, um, Government worker. Yeah, it must be the yeah, poor service. <laughs> He's fishing in the creek. Yeah, yeah. So, um, there you had some nice wood. That might have been a stage photo. But, um, but they would come in, drag them, uh, load them, and work their way back. So, 1904 or 5, Anaconda dismantled two Shea geared locomotives, 
Move them from Bonner to Potomac, including all the rail spikes and log cars. That must have been impressive. But, um, then they would use these end dogs. There's a set of them back there. Basically, as you lifted, they pulled into the logs ends. And once they loaded it, they just had little ropes on there. They just pull them right out. So, Helicopters are currently using those on pipelines. The grab the ends. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they, what, what did you call them? Pig ears. Pig ears? Yeah. I've, there's probably about 10 names. Yep. And, uh, yeah. yep. Um, 1913, Anaconda started building from McNamara Landing to Bonner because uh, it only went to McNamara. Uh, at the same time, Milwaukee bought that spur. Milwaukee actually completed the spur from McNamara to Bonner. So, this is one of the unique machines that. Uh, Anaconda had, it's called the Clyde track layer, basically a steam engine back there, but they had enough rail, um, ties, spikes for the day. And this long I-beam would, uh, they'd rail out the, the ties, lay them, they'd, then they'd rail out the rails, and then they'd bring a bucket out of uh, plates and spikes, and uh, then they'd come back. So. This is how a lot of the rails were built, um, the Clyde track layer. Pretty cool. What's that? They took it out with that. They, that's right. They, yep. It's just reversed the whole thing. Yep. Saved everything, moved to the next next line. So. I don't think so. A lot of times it was so short. I mean, not was short, but I mean, it was. Yeah. It's not going to be down long enough. Yeah. Yep. No. Uh, so. Here he's loading just with a set of tongs. I mean, as you can see, there was no OSHA in those days. Um, but you can see how they cross wrap them. They get a, a tier or two cross wrap, put another tier on top. So, um, this is Anacondas. Uh, this is the American uh, drum works inside. And this ran uh, from 1911 to 1949 and then was later converted. This was steam. And then later converted to gas and diesel. Is it Arkansas? Okay. If you guys know some of these, because I know a lot, you know, but it, yeah. So, uh, I thought it was a different name. There is, but it's <laughs> slide jammer. Yeah. No. Yeah. And basically, what it did, um, is ran on the rails, and so it would winch itself back, load the car, winch itself back. Um, and uh, basically stayed on a rail car all the time. This guy is in a suit. He must be important. Yeah, so. Uh, everybody else is sitting around, but. Um, you can sort of see there's the deck logs. They come in um, and just put the end dogs in, lift it up. Uh, Basically, it would just center themselves. You sort of had to push them over, get them lined up in their little cribs and cradles. Um, the log length was standardized? A lot of 16s. Yep, 16.6 16 was the standardized. Yep. Uh, um, that's the one at the mill or at the fort. Um, we, those logs, Craig, you put those. They came from John Lewis's ranch in Big Hole. 80, late 80, mid 80s? Early? Yep, okay. They were showing their age, so we took those off. Uh, the original booms, we took those off. We've got the new ones, Kieran, uh, so we'll put new booms on um, this spring. So. You put new, new slides? Yep, you got, I remember you cutting those. Yep. This, went up, this was up at Twin Creeks for years, just sort of sitting there decaying. So, but. The other thing that was unique was called the McGifford. And what was unique about this is the slide jammer just basically stayed on the rail cars themselves. This one was actually motorized, and you can see the trucks right there. They would raise up, and as they raised up, these big beams would sit on the ties. And then he could pull cars all the way through, and then load them, and then the cars would come back behind them, and he'd load the cars. When he went to move, pull the cars out of the way, lower the trucks, that raised the beam, and then he could travel up and down the, the rails all 
motorized, so um, pretty slick. There you see the, the trucks in the raised position. So, you sort of date some of these. Uh, this was in Bend, but you know the high wheels, horses still. We hadn't brought in, hadn't brought into the, the dozers yet. And there's the end dogs, and there's OSHA. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Can you distinguish between company employees and Jippos? The guys that are working. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I don't. Did they have any? Jippos back then, or was it all ACM companies? I would assume it was all ACM companies. Most of the loggers company had their camps uh, when they started Bonner. It was all company loggers till 1986. Yeah. yeah. So from 1886 to 1986 was company loggers. Yeah, I don't. Plus they had Jippos on the side. Yeah. They're supposed to. Be yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but pro all the rail, all the big equipment probably was ACM. Yeah. So there's another there's a good example. Uh, this was actually in Camas Prairie, uh, just up the Potomac. You can see the trucks are raised, gear drive, right there. So I've never seen one that survived. So if you see one out in the woods, call me. We'll go get it. So, um, yeah, they were after the pine on that one. So, uh, again, you sort of date it. Here we've got metal uh, arched, so you're getting a little bit later. Uh, but the same, same idea. Uh, 1916, ACM moved operations, including the railroad, up the nine mile where they built 46 miles. That's the main nine mile, and all the spurs. So I don't think they worried about property owners back then. It was just sort of, uh, you know. But uh, Willamette uh, delivered engine number three to Western in 1923. Um, the locomotive was leased to Heron Lumber, later sold to Anaconda, uh, renumbered to number seven, and that's the one out there at display at the fort. So that was actually moving it from Bonner. Uh, it's out there at the museum, Lauren Hurst. And the crane, it is in dire need of a paint job. So um, what's that? Oh. Oh. Probably one of the most things. I mean, there's more wedding pictures taken at that thing than you know. So, but another little bit of trivia: uh, if you've ever read Bud Moore's *The Locksaw Story*, it tells all about the locksaw. It's pretty interesting. Um, but the two guys um, from Northern Pacific and uh, Union Pacific were fighting to get the first railroad from Missoula or Lolo to Lewiston. They actually, as they did their surveys, they would build bridges, little log bridges, across all the side drainages. They wouldn't let the other guys use it. Basically, they were competitors. And so they'd put armed guards at these little bridges. And, um, but after uh, Harriman died, uh, he said, eh, never mind. Uh, but all you had to do was survey the line and the government would grant you the every other section. That's how Plum Creek ended up with the Luxaw, just by this. All they did was survey it, and they got 30-some thousand acres. Now we're moving on to steam. So John Dolber, again, Ephraim Shea sort of brought us in to the geared locomotive. Dolber started mechanical logging. So his patent in, 19, in 1882, um, all it was was a steam-driven capstan. Um, that's actually the patent, 1882. Steam boil, little cylinder, gear drive, and a capstan. Um, capstan basically didn't have a drum. They uh, still use them a lot on ships. But basically it's powered, put a loop around it, give it a little tug, it grabs and um, pulls them in. So. He called it a logging engine. Uh, we started calling them donkeys. I've heard everything from they only had enough. They didn't even have uh, horsepower, so they, they called it a donkey because they didn't even have one horsepower. Um, I heard another one that they actually would use donkeys to pull the cables back out of the woods. So we may never know, but they became donkeys. Yep. That would pull that uh, slide 
slide jammers back on the top? Nope. Right? No, nope. this was strictly just for skidding logs in. All it was. Yep. So, and then they got bigger, better, started using multiple drums. Um, this is where we start to see the high climbers. The guys go up the trees 100 foot, top it, and they put some snatch blocks, some uh, big blocks up on top to get some lift. Um, but this one is actually pulling that steam engine on another one. So, tremendous amount of power. Um, and all they did was just skid them in. Um, later on, they'd start loading with them. Um, but this is in Marble Creek. Um, Marble Creek has a tremendously rich history of, of logging. Um, there's about six of these left over in the woods. Um, took Joan over there a few years ago on Labor Day weekend. Some are right on the main road. Some are you have to talk to the archaeologist and get the coordinates. But uh, they came in on the Milwaukee. You know, the Milwaukee runs down the St. Joe, comes down Avery, and then down the St. Joe. Marble Creek is just down from there. They unloaded right off of uh, the Milwaukee, winched themselves up Marble Creek, and started logging. And then those splash dams, that's where they had the splash dams. There were two guys uh, logging. They became enemies. The bottom guy would not let him use the splash dams. So what he did, he made a um, thousand, 10,000 foot, what they call incline railroad. This has 5,000 feet of cable. And so he had one at 5,000 feet and then another one at 10,000 feet. And he would rail the cars up this about a 20% incline and then lower them down into the next valley by where Santa is, just on the other side of St. Mary's. Um, but uh, these things are still there. It looks like they were there on Friday and left. Choker's still around. They're still guide back to the trees. Um, I have tried to figure out how am I going to get that out of there without them knowing. So. <laughs> If you see one at the museum, don't tell anybody. No. Midnight requisition. Mm -hmm. That's the cable. There's 5,000 feet of inch and a half. Um, wow. Tremendous. And we don't even have that on our line machines today. 1,200, 1,400 on machines around today. So uh, pretty cool. I mean, Marble Creek is just a lot of history. So uh, the steam engines, um, the first traction engines, we basically just used them to pull the logs, whether on uh, some type of wagons, sometimes we just drug them. But you imagine the problem we have with fires today, um, how many fires they must have had with open stacks. So, um, um, Benjamin Holt, 1804, uh, tested his first track uh, style steam tractor. So you're starting to see. Uh, them thinking about tracked machines, but you can see basically they just use the steam engines as basically a big tow rig. Um, this is where we started getting into that bigger, better, well, I can not only load, but, or I can skid. Uh, so this thing is what you would hook up to a big A-frame. Um, it could skid, it could load. Uh, you can just see how many drums it had. Um, this is getting pretty much modern, the high end of the steam logging. Yeah. Um, this one is fairly unique. Uh, it's called a Lombard. They took a steam engine, put tracks on it, but they couldn't figure out how to steer it. <laughs> this guy steers these wheels. It's like a caterpillar. They can actually break the, the uh, power to it. But I know these were used a lot in the Northeast and the Midwest. I cannot find a record if, we, if they ever came out this far. Uh, they yes? They had one up nine miles in the corny. OK. And it came to bother. And I have never found anybody to know where it went. No, I went left bottom. OK. So you, there was one up nine miles. OK. And it was at Bonner. OK. For a short time. OK. 
Again, if you see this in the woods, call me. <laughs> but this poor guy, and these guys in back have all the heat in the world off the boiler. This boy in front uh, had to be Armstrong steering. Just it's all it did was just steered those front wheels or those front skis. But the crawler tractors. Um, this is our uh, 1918 Holt out of the museum. Um, Holt and Best started developing on their own and started competing and uh, they competed against each other for years. If you look at a Holt and a Best um, prior to the merger, they look very similar because they kept stealing each other's ideas and patents. Um, they spent between the two $1.5 million in legal fees fighting the battle. It's $100 million today just fighting each other on. Uh, but if you look at a, a best um, and a Holt, very similar. So, but, so, quiz one. What year did they merge, become Caterpillar? Someone's got to know. 1930. <coughs> 1925, Holt, they finally just said, enough's enough. Sales were down for both of them. Um, and they formed the Caterpillar Tractor Company. So, um, first blade um, was a 1925. And there are some old pictures of they would have oxen with this blade out in front. And I think that's where they got the term bulldozer and it stuck. So, but, uh, again, OSHA was alive and well. Um, and um, basically, again, at first, they were just used for dragging. They, they did not do anything else. They just were great, had a lot of horsepower, very reliable, and they just used them to drag logs. During the winter, they could pull sleds, do that same thing, replace horses. But, I mean, that is a little, you know, like a five ton or a, you know, cat 10 or 15, pull, pulling a lot of, a lot of wood. So. Do it the hills. Whee! Oh. <laughs> Quiz number two. What was the original color? Uh, of caterpillars. Marvin, no! What color are some of the dozers out at the museum? Rust? Gray. The original color was slate gray um, until 19, December 7th, 1931. And they switched over to high, what they called highway yellow. So, okay, okay. Uh, no. uh, what's that? Oh, I thought you said green. Okay, he gets a cook. Give him a cookie. Okay. So they were actually gray uh, up until, well, it was actually ten years before Pearl Harbor. So, uh, so. Hey Scott. Yes. The wife of the deer. They donated a gray one to the fort, and then it turned out yellow, and she got mad because yep. they yep. repainted it. Yep. Westmont, um, <coughs> God, just went brain dead. <coughs> Who owned Westmont? <coughs> Bill Gallagher. 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 Bill and Gallagher. Mrs. Gallagher. Gallagher. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> we were trying to get a donation through her. Um, we drove her out. And yeah, she said, yeah, these are all painted the wrong color. And you're going, no, they're not. Yeah, so we, but, um, so again, stack them up, throw them on a wagon, pretty much any way to get them to the, you know, to the landing. Cat 60s um, were like the D8s of the time. Um, very reliable, had a lot of horsepower. They actually started with a bar in the flywheel um, to get them going. So um, there's probably a lot of guys that, uh, yeah. Um, but we actually, 
We just got one. The guy donated a couple years ago from over in Helena, um, and it's on our restoration list. But, um, well. but back then, I don't think you had to worry not only about OSHA, but about DNRC or EQ. You know, yeah. So it was pretty much get him to the landing. So um, there's the bar and the flywheel. Basically, you just put that bar in the flywheel. Yeah. Yep. Prime the prime the cylinders. Yep. Hey, yes. Yeah. Check two. Oh, I, I, just had, I just had a question. I was mm -hmm. wondering when were they, when did they go from the gas cats to diesel cats in the forties? <laughs> we have a couple chokers back there. Um, this is like the ring and top. This is the ring. There's a couple other back there that have just have the lip. Um, so Dennis brought some in over there, and I've got a couple back there. Um, but like Dennis has, those ones he has, I mean, the button's got to be inch and a half, two inches. They actually, you couldn't shove them under the log against the ground. So they had what they called choker spoons. They were just like a little shovel on a long pole. Scoop it out, scoop it out, scoop it out, and finally they get the, the button underneath the log. And uh, uh, But it didn't take many of those to make a load. So, but. <laughs> <laughs> now it's your turn. <laughs> I would guess in the 40s they went to diesel, but I don't know that. 1940. 1940. Any other guesses? 36. They weren't the first, I mean, diesels result, developed before that, but this is the D9900 was the first diesel engine that was offered in 1931 in their Cat 60. So. Yeah, there's a best. If you see that same tractor in a Holt, the only thing different is the name. I mean, just yeah, they kept stealing each other's patents. Yep. Oh. Now you're starting to see. Okay, we can drag them, we can put them on a wagon, or we can lift them up and haul more. So now you're starting to see. Well, if we could have done it with the high wheels, why can't we do it with an arch and a dozer? So. You start to see the dozers, um, that's still a slip tongue. There's the Jacobs bar, so you can identify it's a slip tongue. Uh, Dodge wheels um, and a McGifford loader. Um, that's a Cat 60. Uh, and there's the arches starting to come in. Some, they would run hydraulic, do a little lifting. Again, now we're basically into whatever you could make at the shop. Uh, Silas Overpack's wheels were still used um, to about the 20s and 30s, but then they just started, well, if we can make them out of wood, why don't we just make them out of steel? So they started making them out of steel. Um, did the same thing when they went to the arches, um, and you get that weight off the ground, um, your pulling power um, reduces by about 80%. I think I've got, yep. Um, just by lifting those logs off the ground, um, you could reduce your skid needs by 80%. So when Tyner, my middle boy, was in high school, he was in physics class, and I was rebuilding the, doing all the research on the high wheels, I said, okay, how do I find out? So he did actually did it as a physics project, and he did all the calculations of how much less energy it took the horses to pull a, dry, a down log versus on the high. High wheels on. Yeah. Away with the dozing effect too. yeah, it gets rid of the dozing effect. Yep, on the wheels. Yep. Oh. 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 So now you're starting to see winches. Um, they got away from chopping into the logs there too when you quit dragging. Yep. The conventional undercut was in. Enormous benefit yep. because it made a sled right It is basically a sled, yep. <coughs> Get her turned right, yep. Scott, did you repeat? Yes, yep. Scott, yep. Did you repeat that option? Uh, basically, what they did when they started using arches, 
uh, that butt cut would have that undercut that we showed, you know, would be chopped out. They'd throw that on the bottom, it'd be like a little plow, you know, so it wouldn't dig in. Once you did the arches, that nah, didn't matter. They're lifted up, so. But this was actually on a fire. Um, um, quiz number three. Yes. Okay. Before the EPA. Yeah, yeah. 1932 was the first. Ed Heilman did the research for me on this one. Um, and, uh, oh. Uh, now you're starting to see the arches. Um, we have several arches out at the museum. We have some rubber tire, we have some tracks. They were really good. They're just like trying to back up a, a one foot tongue, long tongue trailer. They would not back up, so you sort of had to make the loop. But, um, the reason for the, for the tracks flotation. Flotation, yep. Uh, rubber tire, basically just uh, the tracks would roll so easy, the rubber tire would roll so easy, but getting those logs, uh, the weight on the tracks of the rubber tire, um, you're down to 20% pull versus, you know, what it would take to drag all those on the ground, so. Now we're also witnessing the loss of the old growth forest in Western Montana. Talked to the guys, they were actually moving. Um, had a uh, self loader come over and, uh, but the wheels were in tough shape, but um, that's it today, we rebuilt it. But again, found the original patent and it was called a Baker Manny scraper. And uh, so now the patents, for a long time, the patents were online only to 65, and you had to go to the books before that. Now everything is online, and as they scanned the patents, they didn't just scan it like a normal scan today, is you can word search. And so if you're looking for a name, looking for a date, um, so a lot of times if you have a date, a name, um, you can pull up these patents. So, and, uh, how, but, many, how many hours in that restoration? Uh, um, that one, um, Dave Watkins rebuilt the wheels, the same guy who rebuilt the, the high wheels. Um, and uh, this one probably 20, 30 hours. Um, the high wheels was in the hundreds. I mean, if not way more, yeah. High wheels was one of the biggest projects. So. Then the scrapers, this is another Baker Manny, but you can tell they beefed it up, started pulling it with tractors a little bit more, um, needed to beef it up. So, 1931, Caterpillar introduced the first motorized grader uh, called the Auto Patrol. This one, if you go from Georgetown Lake to Anaconda, back down by Silver Lake, I was going there one day, this thing's sitting on the cut slope. So, as forester, half my other foresters, they're looking for elk in the field, and I'm looking in the farmer's field for <laughs> iron. And um, the guy ended up passing away, and the uh, uh, family donated it to us, and Schulte helped bring us, and we actually got the engine running, and it actually runs now. So, but uh, 1931, I mean, the technology is just amazing. Yep, so, but. Again, using scrapers a lot, pulled behind the dozers. Um, and these things, they have side shift on the wheels, tilt. I mean, just about anything you have on the, today, they still have, or they had them. This was an Adams. Um, we picked up over by Great Falls. And um, oh, that's it. What it that's a, what a restoration project looks like. <laughs> You take about a hundred pictures before you tear it apart because in a year you will not remember if A or B goes in that hole. Yeah, so, um, and you can see the paint. Yeah, yeah, now, not a whole lot of paint, but, um, but basically a lot of these is you tear them apart, you fix them, you bend them, you weld them, and you just slowly put it back together. A lot of times you got to go back to the pictures. Um, but you'll recognize that thing. What's that thing? That, that's the dome of the teepee burner. Um, we were 
restoring the panels and building the, the foundation at the same time. So, give you an idea, uh, this thing is 21 feet across. Um, when you look at it on top, on the top there, you go, yeah, it's not that high. So, uh, the top of the TP burner um, is 51 feet tall, so that's five stories tall. It doesn't look it when you see it, but, so, you know, but, so that's about three quarters of the way through the restoration, and that was full restoration. There's one of the other pull graders. Uh, that's a Cat 66, and that's an Austin Weston in the background. So this one we hooked up to the dozers and got to play well both those. You know, but. So the tumble buckets, um, they would have, let me show you here. The tumble buckets had wheels tucked in there. And they were actually back behind there. So the, grader, the tractor would pull it, scoop up the dirt. He would back up and these wheels would now be on the ground with the, the basically this part sticking up, be full of dirt, cruise down the road, and then had a string onto that, and then he would pull it, it would unhook it, and that whole thing would rotate. Um, this just pivots on right there. So as you're pulling, you pull that string, hits the latch, and it just rotates, dumps the, the dirt, comes back and latches, put it back on the wheels, take it back to where you were. Um, again, this is 1920 technology, so pretty slick. Um, there's the rope. That's how he controlled it. You can see the rope there. Yep. So, scoop it up, back up, get it on top, go down the road a little bit, dump it. This is a Caterpillar uh, elevating scraper. Uh, this was, had a Cat 22 engine that would sit, oh there it is there, and it would, if you windrow dirt, it would scoop it up and would have a conveyor crane and dump into a, a horse-drawn wagon. Oh, uh, look at all those gears and, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. But, and again, they used a lot of just small cranes. This is a Bay City uh, shovel. Um, this is just about a Clancy uh, above Mark's Miller's. Uh, Clem Au actually um, told me about it, found the owner. The guy grows mushrooms up there um, just above Clancy. And uh, so Gary Marks brought his end loader over, low boyed it to Missoula for us. And uh, we redid the boom and uh, the bucket. And, uh, but these Bay Cities, the Bay Cities, um, uh, the Inslees, um, a lot of those were from the turn of the century. So uh, this one's so far rusted that it'll just be a static display, but pretty cool. Um, the dozers, um, you know, started coming in in what, 1925. Until then, everything was drug, but they really couldn't figure out how to, how do you move dirt? So then they started using hydraulic cylinders, push on the back, raise on the front. Um, then in uh, real tough ground, these Laterno's uh, rippers. That looks like a crick. Mm, yeah, so. Unfortunately, that was the easiest spot. We are dealing with that today what we call legacy roads, where they just, that was the easiest spot, just go up the gut, push the curb. Well, that's how they built, if you drive from Lolo Pass um, to Lewiston, half that area in there, they drilled shot, pushed it in the creek. I mean, so that's how they did it, so, but. It's a lot easier than dragging a wet log down there. Yeah, exactly. yep, yep. Uh, fire line with the dozer. Uh, a little bit on the trucking. Um, these poor guys, loud, Armstrong, a lot of these were chain drive. Um, this was sort of interesting. Um, this is up at uh, Clearwater. The, the cow is sitting like right, right about there. You can see the old railroad grade. Um, right. 
compared to today's truck. So found this, 1937, Anaconda starts uh, using trucks to haul timber instead of the rails. Um, so you started to see that, those trucks coming in. You know, those first ones, <coughs> they were so tough to drive. Now you've got a cab, you've got a heater. Yep, you're starting to get a modern necessities. OSHA is still nowhere to be seen. There's that end dog with the rope. So he just loads them, gets them in that cradle, guy pulls them, and uh, they come out and start all over again. So. You read any obituaries? There was a lot of guys named Lefty, yeah, and, uh, yeah, so, but, um, George Knapp gave me some of these photos. I do have them labeled at home, but uh, they were pretty neat. Of course, George Knapp, White Pine Sash, he started with White Pine in 48, um, so for years they cut these big yellow pine up for White Pine, but. Uh, 58. 58. 58? George yeah. went to school in 53. Yeah. Okay. We're in the same place. Okay. He was a classic enemy. <laughs> okay. No. You gotta watch these old. I, they know. I know. I, I'm making a note. I just got made a mental note. So, um, then they, you know, we started using cable as the, the flatter ground started uh, running out. We started running cables down the hill, line skidding. This is basically just loading with with a heel boom and cables. Um, was a spooner, but that a boy has a hard hat. So, boat just going. Spooner operator on that was old spooner. Was it spooner? So here are those pictures. I found these. Uh, Clearwater Junction is right there, and I'm going, huh? I wonder if I could find that same spot. So I went up there. You're on the old railroad grade. Um, you know, the state office, Sperry Grade, is back this way, maybe a mile or so. Um, so I went back and found and just said, okay, this is about it. But if you look at that opening, that's that opening right there. So um, this still had, had some natural openings. That's it today, just all grown in. You know, trees come back. Yeah. So, so that was what, 70, no, 50? Yeah, all the way to last year, so pretty cool, 56 years later. So. Cable yarding, again, we started doing a lot of the cable yarding as a steeper ground. Um, either use the end dogs, tongs, or these Coeur d'Alene style grapples. Um, it's a dying art, but um, the guys who run the line machines today uh, still know how to do it. Boy, I tell you, it's, it's a dying art. Uh, Les Zimmerman tried to teach me when I was up at Twin Creeks and whatever you do with your hands you do opposite with your feet and I forgot to let go and the chokers came around and busted the windows and I stepped down and said I'll stick to hydraulics and so you know but Orville Spooner taught Les this would be a heel boom all it really did it would grab the log and um, a lot of the old long booms you would have to grab the log in the middle balance it this, you grab it a little bit for, towards you, it would lift it up, catch on this heel boom, and then you could pivot it a little bit more. On the old style long booms, once you grabbed it, you had a little tag line that just sort of gave it a tug, but didn't turn it. So it was left, right, tag, so, um, but dying art, so. This was sort of, they took a caterpillar, put a frame and some winches on it, and started doing some little yarding below the road. This was probably sort of that blend between, okay, we've, the cat ground's running out, how are we gonna get the, the steeper ground? So, but I think this was this just built in the shop, and uh, you know, that's how a lot of the early ones were. So, but Sontag ran this thing for years. Uh, Al um, sat right there, had a little wood stove by his foot, had a little uh, boom in there, but he skidded all day long for years with that. It's got American drums and clutches. The clutches, you know, in today's, you know, or even the old yarders, um, they were um, just like a brake liner. This thing had wood, cottonwood frictions. And um, there was one guy still in Idaho making these cottonwood frictions. and. Uh, but uh, 
Um, we actually drove that out. Al, the family donated that. We put a new boom on it. Um, but he used that all the way into the into the 90s. So, but Idaho, I mean, a lot of these guys, they came back from the war. They could get these old surplus. They put some American drums on it um, and go log them. But, and then this is what you find in the woods. And to me, this is a treasure. This is, how am I going to get this out of there? With, yeah, so, um, um, this one actually is on the Union Creek Ranch. Billy Jones from Triple W and RDO sent me this. Um, he thinks it's a Chevy frame just by the engine, but gear drive. So it was some type of a yarder slash loader, but um, yeah, just these intrigue me. And, um, and I'd rather, you know, uh, a lot of times what happens, the grandfather, the grand, you know, the father had these, he passes away. The kids don't have a clue. They don't know what to do with it. A lot of it is they give it to the museum, just they know it'll be cherished and preserved. Yep, so, but, um, healing in the uh, fish creek. So, um, but he's got a hard hat. Still on the rack, but he's still got a hard hat. So, but, um, know those guys yet? You probably know some of them. You're in the, t yeah. That's Orville Spooner's shovel. Still shovel? Okay. Um, Another one of those, um, I thought it was a Ford. The guys are thinking that's a Chevy. I don't know. Anyway, this is up by the Big Snowies. Jason Todd Hunter found this when he was out hunting. This is on the list to bring home. So, Again, it's on Forest Service, so you know nothing. So, yeah. But, Never seen it before. Yeah, yeah, where is that? No. But, you know, I mean, you just look at that thing. Um, you know, they drove it some, I mean, and then this had to have been factory, and uh, at least the drums were, so, um, but they probably yarded with it for years, yeah, but, so. on the front, you drive it out. I'll rebuild that engine right there, yeah, so, but. This is um, um, Ben Smith, who, young guy, great logger, uh, comes from a logging family, Saw this across the creek up by Nevada Reservoir. Um, we think this is an Inslee. We haven't gone and seen it yet. It's still snowed in. Inslee was not had um, very large um, idlers. So, and just from what we could tell, but I mean, this is uh, probably about a 1910, 1912 era. The old wooden booms before they even had uh, steel booms. Yeah, wooden sides. So. I have a hard time finding it in the brush. Mm -hmm. I know where it's at. And I know the gentleman that brought it in there. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Supposedly it's on four service. It was an old, it was an old claim, but it's claim. yeah, it's not in. I mean, yeah, well, catch me later because yeah, we want to go. Um, but supposedly it's across the creek. We got to yeah, and all that stuff. But anyway, but I mean, we just see that stuff. I mean, my, I mean, I just yeah, this is too cool to just let it rot away. So, but. So, like you need another project. Yeah, I like could do. Yeah, but so then you start thinking about okay, what's the future of logging? Um, so this is some conceptual drawings some guys had years ago in '03. Uh, um, flying feller bunchers, um, and uh, uh, who knows? But um, Timberjack is developing this. Um, it. Uh, senses where it puts its foot pad. If it's too soft, it'll move it. And um, uh, this is a big processor head. Um, but you know the technology has come tremendous. Whether this thing will ever be in production, I don't know. So, well, there it is. You know, as it walks, it senses and it'll move if it's too soft. <laughs> they say the ground pressure is less than this, but um, 
you know, ground pressure is nothing more than weight over footprint. But, you know, you look how small those pads are, but they say this has less than, you know, a feller buncher or whatever, but um, still pretty neat, yeah. So, but anyway, got to give a plug to Forestry Day, April 30th, coming up. Um, it's the one of the one of the kind, only pro-am. So we bring in, if you've seen the guys on ESPN, same guys there. Uh, the colleges from all over the Northwest compete. We compete together, but in separate events. I mean, we'll do the college double buck, and then we'll do the pro double buck. Um, we'll run the sawmill. Clem Al brings the, uh, his draft team out, pulls the high wheels. So April 30th, um, pretty neat. And then 4th of July, the 3rd and the 4th, the big equipment show uh, out the fort. Um, so plan on that. So um, this was a picture Dax took. Unfortunately, this gal's from Flathead Community College, but this gal stands probably about four foot eight. That log is about that high on me. And she didn't, she literally is hurdling that. So that, she is hurdling about that tall. So that was a pretty cool picture, Dex. Yeah, I mean, it was just, yeah, so. Uh, but and that's the sawmill. Um, steam powered sawmill. That is a video, but it is not working. But um, so. anyway, if you want to come out, we'll put you to work, pull boards, uh, a lot of on the job training. Um, and uh, um, but I want to thank the trout wines. You guys are always there with the engine. And, and uh, so, uh, but. So. Now, does everybody have questions for Scott? Yep, now it's over. I got 10 minutes. Cool. No. Uh-oh. Question time. No. Yes. Well, he's got to have the mic, he said. So he'll um, roam around. Um, about 25 years ago, an old-timer friend of mine named Cal Samsel uh, told me a story about logging up Silly Swan when he was young. And uh, they were pulling a locomotive across a lake that was frozen. And it went through the ice. And he said, to this day, it's still there or something. The rumor is there's one in Swan Lake. Everybody says no. Um, I don't know. Yeah. If, does anybody else know about the one in, Sam, in Swan Lake? In salmon, yeah. Uh, but I don't know if that's one of those. I mean, you probably wouldn't, if it went in the ice, they probably wouldn't have left it. I mean, they would have solved it, but um, yeah. I don't know. So I've heard that one too. Yeah. So. The, his it's, it's one. the history of the tiki burner at mm -hmm. Fort Missoula, can you give us a little one? Um, that was originally down at um, a mill in Connor. And then um, they moved it to the fairgrounds at um, Hamilton. They actually tried to make that into their museum, but teepee burners were never designed to be waterproof. They're 18-sided. They're eight feet at the bottom, each one of those panels. They're 18 panels. They're eight foot at the bottom, four foot at the top, and they're just angle iron. And that, they had put the fiberglass over the dome. Normally, that's a screen to catch the embers. Um, they were going to tear it down. Bob Brown, the museum director, gets a call. He calls me, so we go down there. And you just look at this thing, you're going, okay, uh, this is pretty cool, but you know exactly how much work you have for the next four years ahead of you. Um, I yeah, and, um, but there was 11 teepee burners in Missoula Valley. And they're zero now. And, you know, in the 1970 Clean Air Act pretty much wore that, you know, they ran out. So um, we knew, okay, we had to do something. Um, so D&G Crane, Van Nielsen, all donated their time. Uh, we took that down. And it took about a year to rebuild all the panels. Uh, we actually had to have Able Moving move the dome. I mean, 20-foot wide dome is as wide as 93, so it was basically moving a house. Um, took us a couple years, repainted it on the ground. D&G Crane came in, um, and uh, we started on Saturday, and by noon on Sunday, the dome was on. We got the iron workers uh, caught wind that uh, 
we were doing this, and I got a call from the Iron Worker Union. He goes, yeah, I heard you're going to do some iron. And I thought they were trying to get a job, and you know. And, and he goes, no, no, we, we need community service as we go through our journeymen, whatever. And we had about a half a dozen iron workers that this is actually all they do, up and down, climbing. But between them and, and uh, uh, we actually had Mac Palmer up there on the uh, little man lift, um, 50 feet up. And, and uh, but as you do that, as you put those panels together, they all have to be guided back. There was cables everywhere and then once it's all in place then we weld it to the base the base being Missoula is anybody Missoula County what good <laughs> um, these things were never these were just put on a slab but since we're in the city limits out there at the museum uh, we actually had to get a building permit and have an engineer draw the foundation, 18-sided foundation, full four foot deep, the frost wall, the whole works for a teepee burner. <laughs> and so once, once it was up, we welded it down. But until it was welded down, we, we actually wanted it to slide a little bit. And the last panels went in on Sunday morning. But, you know, in the back of your head, boy, if the wind gust comes along, this whole thing's going to go scattered. And, and, but guys like D&G Crane, Harold, and Mike, I mean, you know, they move the library car a couple times. I mean, guys like that just make your life easy. So I got to always give credit to those guys. So, but it's interesting now. Um, you'll be out there working. The uh, bagpipers will go in, and they love the resonant sound. And uh, and that bagpipe, you can hear it for miles. And you're just sitting out there, just listening to bagpipers all day long. So, but it was pretty pretty cool. It's interesting when you drive when you go up to it. You don't realize that it's 51 feet tall. You go, that ain't that big. And if you ever have walked inside and look up, it goes about 10 times bigger. It's just how your eye catches it. So, but that's on the website. There's a whole thing on there on yep on how we did it. And uh, but how's your website? Again? What's that? What's your website? Oh, okay. Forestrydays.com. Okay. Yep. Scott, the, uh, Marsh reporter asked that question about the teepee burner, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but she has a great story about the teepee burner that was out here in, at the at the mill. Can you tell that, Marsha? Number one, first, the teepee burner at Connor. I want, right up to your the teepee burner at Connor, I want to go back to that because both of my, two of my brothers and my ex-husband worked in that when it was at Connor. Really? So I wanted to hear that story. Okay. Right. Now, the teepee burner out here at Bonner, I work at Missoula County. It's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Didn't work at building department by any chance. Okay, that was my pro yeah. So. No, it wasn't the building department. I was records management supervisor. And part of my job was determining what records we needed to keep and what needed we what records we could get rid of. And this was back in the 80s to the mid 90s. <coughs> we didn't have a way to dispose of those records that we could. So we brought them out to Bonner. There were two women, three women and one man in our department. And we carried these horribly big, heavy, broken boxes up that teep to the top of that teepee burner, the burner and put them in the top of the teepee <laughs> burner. We couldn't get the men to help us at the county. <laughs> but we put the, poured the contents in, and the cinders are coming up. They did make us wear a hard hat, though. And ironically, my son was working at Bonner at the time, and we're pouring these boxes of paper in at the top, and it jammed it down below. <laughs> Shut the mill down? I heard it from my son that night, yeah. <laughs> so that's my story. <laughs> what? You remember the burner at the White Pine Sash? A little bit, not it really. Probably, it was probably 90 feet tall. A little closer. 90 feet tall, I would say. It was one of the bigger burners in the whole area. And they quit using it in the early 70s, and they tore it down, I think, in the spring of 93. It took them about a half a day to tear it down with a big excavator. All, as much iron as they yep. All that's in there is angle iron and some tin. Yeah, there's not much to them. And uh, yeah, you could tear these down in a heartbeat. And But taking it down, uh, 
carefully was a lot longer. Yeah, because we knew we had to put it back up. Yeah. So. Hey, Scott? Yeah. To entertain you. Uh oh. I make mistakes, so I always got something to talk about. If I talk about my mistakes. <laughs> but we're taking down a teepee burner. The Archie Weaver had the crane on it. It was up near Stevenville. And I was up there cutting the heads off the bolts, mm -hmm. the torque, standing on a little hang wire. And the head of a bolt got inside my <laughs> shoe. <laughs> Took about three years for that to heal up. <laughs> Pretty sensitive spot down there, isn't it? A lot of soft skin, yeah. So, uh. I had a question about the, the uh, wagon. I see you had in a couple of pictures, uh, like a behind one of the holts uh, mm -hmm. for hauling logs. Mm -hmm. uh, were, did they use wagons with wheels mm -hmm. on them to yep. haul logs in yep. western Montana? Big stout ones, I mean spokes like that. Down um, around Bend, Oregon, I've actually seen where they're actually solid. They look like you would take a you know eight inch cookie off a log uh, and put a band around it and an axle. But when you look at it carefully, they're little tiny wedges. And as it got uh, wore out, they'd put new wedges in. They were just small chunks of wood. But when you look at it, it just looks like one big, you know, Flintstone style, you know, uh, wheel. But they're actually little tiny. So the guy's sitting there. Yeah. But uh, there's actually at the museum, just off the end between the teepee burner and the sawmill, one of the log wagons. But it was one of the, the uh, you know, I guess half ton style or quarter ton. I mean, they weren't, that wasn't one of the big ones, yeah, but. Well. The few times I go out to the fort to work on the steam engine or something like that, I always see you out there uh, fooling around all, with all this stuff and wonder why this guy spends so much time. I see, now I see why you have the passion and, and I got hooked. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I sure appreciate all the time yeah. you spend working out there. And yeah, I sure and like to see more people helping you out. Yeah, and my wife, a lot of times, you know, I don't go hunting, but I go out to the museum a lot, so I got to give credit to Joan. Yeah, so where are you going? The fort. Yep, so, yeah. <laughs> oh. no. Yep, but. We have all the paint for the top of the teepee burner in our garage. Yeah, there's still paint, and yeah, and uh, we pick three or four projects a year. The Appleton drag saw will be this year, um, and, uh, um, um, and then we got an old hay packer. They use old hay presses. Um, instead of bringing all the hay in and bailing it, they would take these out to the, the wood or the field, run them off an old steam engine or hit and miss. And uh, this thing's got gears and arms, and we're getting the axles rebuilt right now. So probably not by Forestry Day, but probably by uh, Fourth of July, we'll have the hay press going. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, my question. Your question. In using the springboards, mm -hmm. do they only notch in at the bottom to fall the entire tree, or did they notch going up to top a tree? Or the springboard, um, the notch itself, um, I don't know if I can go back real um, The notch is, the first hit is down at about 45 degrees, and then come in flat, second one's a little steeper, and the bottom one cleans it out. So it's only about uh, three inches deep. Don't get dizzy looking at this. Um, the notch uh, is flat on the bottom and goes to almost to a point. Uh, and then um, this is the first hit, flat second. Third is a little bit steeper. Fourth one is clean it out. But, um, but that tip is curved. And so when, you're, when these guys are putting a springboard, it's actually up in, catches that lip, and when you put weight on it. But, you know, you saw those pictures of fat boy me up there. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you can get out there. They are. That's my question. See where they've gone up like three levels? Do they do that because of the width of the tree? Or yep. do they go way you just up keep, and top You just it keep or? going up until you're above the butt swell. The butt swell okay. on larch is where that bark color changes and the taper quits. Okay. 
This one I cheated. We put in with a chainsaw. Oh, don't look at that. So, um, as, you, as you're using your crosscut saw, as you're using your crosscut saw, you have to walk the board around yep. the tree, otherwise you right. cut your thigh open. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and that's what. Yeah. But you don't go higher. Typically. Right. That's it. See, I don't know you. Two board, one to two boards. I mean, you look at the ones out around Sea Lake. Um, they're about one board. Um, you know, that, so. One board, you chop in about waist high, what's comfortable. And then, so if you're standing on that, your cross cut saw would be about waist high on that one. Um, but you just keep going until you're above the butt swell. Okay. Yep. And then you follow the whole tree. Yep. Yep. No. And then this hinge, uh, you can literally um, aim that. You know, a lot of times we put a stake or a hat out there. As you're coming on the back side, you saw in. But what's interesting, you know, when you fall a tree with a chainsaw, nowadays we have earplugs in, you know, and falls. This is so quiet. All you hear is the whoosh, 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 throw the little oil on it. But when that tree goes, because you're leaving that hinge, that hinge keeps that direction in the right direction. Those trees creak and groan and do more things. And they always say the safest spot is on the springboards because it, when it goes, it goes off and out, and uh, it, you know, and you come up a little bit on the backside. So, um, yeah, when it goes, you hand the saw down as it's going. You actually pretend, but you, you just push it all the butt off. And, yeah, but uh, sort of again, it's a little dying art that we could try to keep alive. How yeah. much oil does it take? Not much, no, and that's just a beer bottle that you take a nail and put the hook in it and then the old guys would just take pine needles shove the pine needles in there and just use it like a little brush um, and uh, just larch you know larch is actually water soluble so a lot of times you you do a little larch a little water but fur and all these other ones um, little kerosene, kerosene. Yeah, I've, I've seen the bottles in all you know kids eat photographs for yep. example, same thing and wondering what's kind of the no. But you'll see, if you find a bottle that is a uh, oiling bottle, it'll have that little hook on it, and probably the pine needles are gone, but very distinguished hook that you wrap around and you just set it on the bark and it just grabs. Yep. Some did, yep. Basically whatever, larch is a little bit more water soluble, um, but fir, pine, um, you know, you wanted something that would cut the pitch because it would just gum it up. Yeah. So, yeah. Scott, would you go one more picture forward? What's that? Would you go one more picture forward? You see, the you were asking about the how high they went with the springboards. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, it's to make up for the slope of the ground yeah. on the downhill side. Otherwise, you're pulling the crosscut saw at ear level, yeah. and you don't have much strength that way. So the guy on the uphill side is mm -hmm. doing it all himself. Yeah. And then the larch is. The, about the only way you can cut it is with water because mm -hmm. when I cut the beams in my house the chainsaw would quit gum up. it actually and you'd have to pry it out with yeah. a screwdriver but if you used a, a fire pump we call them piss pumps and you just kept water on the end of it yeah. it'd keep cutting mm -hmm. Scott the music is playing <laughs> we're going to have to call it okay quick. yep okay I would I'd like to oh. can I the one Thing too is on the back table is a bunch of stuff we brought, um, pretty unique stuff. So if you get time, uh, take a look before you leave. It's pretty cool old stuff. So I really like to thank Scott. This this was a great a great presentation, and uh, I think we learned a lot that we never so. knew before. His I, I invite you to check out his the website of the what forestrydays.com. Forestrydays.com. Um, if for nothing else, that timeline that was going around here has has uh, the best and most accurate history of even the, the Blackfoot and Bonner milling that I've ever seen. I use it all the time for reference. Um, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the other the other thing is I would invite everyone to check out the uh, Bonner History Museum uh, Center and Museum down at the post office if you haven't. There's always something going on there. I don't get there down, down there enough as it is, but those people that are doing that are immensely, um, well, they're putting a lot of work into it. So I, I would invite you all to go.
and I wouldn't. The the hours are what? Anybody? Tuesday morning, 10 to 12-ish with fresh cookies. Nine. Oh, 9 to 12. And then Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday afternoons, 2 to 4.30. Wednesday and Thursday afternoon, 2 to 4.30. Let's go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.